talking about generally broadening it out to planning with a quick, a quick question, we need an answer uh, from each of you quickly on this. Um, for a long time, the city has been working on this broader making room program, which will come before the next mayor and council. Um, and it looks at adding triplexes and townhouses and three and four story apartment buildings to residential neighborhoods. If you were mayor, would you go back to the drawing board and scrap this plan? Or would you use it as a, as a starting point and make changes from there? So scrap it or change it. Kennedy? I would uh, keep it and adjust. Okay, Ken? We, we'd adjust. Absorb it into a new city plan. Scrap it and start all over again because the communities okay. and the neighbors have had no say. Okay, good. So as, thank you for that. A specific question then to, for Ken Sim. Um, the current city council's faced resistance, as we know, and, and the previous council as well, to increase density um, both on the east side and the west side of the city from Grandview Heights to, to, to the west side. So how specifically, as mayor, do you get buy-in across the city to accept whatever level of density you're proposing? That's a great question. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to come up with the citywide plan and we're actually con con we're going to consult with all of our neighborhoods and we're going to ask them what they want and then we're going to build accordingly. And the comment I usually get right after I make that statement is you're going to have a bunch of NIMBYs in every single neighborhood that will say no. And I, I'd preface this with, I've actually spoken to about 6,900 residents in the city of Vancouver since April 13th. So I have a pretty good feel for what they're saying. I'll use an east side, uh, east Vancouver and a west side Vancouver uh, example. So if you look at density, um, if, if you were to ask residents at Commercial and Kitchener if they wanted a 20-story uh, tower on the drive, everyone would say no. Those same individuals, if you ask them if they want a 20-story um, a tower or a tower um, six blocks to the south at the Commercial SkyTrain station, they're receptive to it because we're not creating a livability problem. It's right on transit and it fits in the uh, community. And so that's the answer there. When you go to Dunbar, I've posed the same question. I can tell you, I haven't heard a single person who said they want, oh, they want a tower uh, in Dunbar. But the conversation is, you know what? We actually want Dunbar to be lively. We want to see our kids and grandkids on the street. We're receptive to townhomes and um, rural housing. And so that's the conversation there. And so we, we trust the people of Vancouver. We're going to listen for the first time in 10 years. We are going to listen to the residents of Vancouver, unlike you know, uh, Vision and their friends like uh, Kennedy Stewart. Um, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to change the way CACs are um, you know, paid out, so to speak. Instead of CACs or community amenity contributions, community and many contributions going uh, into general revenues where people don't see them, we're actually going to put them into the communities where the development happens. So we're going to change the conversation where residents will actually say, you know what, we used to fight this, but you know what, we'd love to see some money go into our community centre and we're receptive to a bit of density. Okay. Thank you. Kennedy? Yeah, so, uh, you know, our population is going to be increasing in this city and uh, sometimes that's tough and it causes strain but it's also what make it, it makes it a great place to live. I mean all the exciting dynamic stuff that happens around the world happens in great cities like Vancouver so we do have to uh, make more room. Uh, and so that's why my plan uh, incorporates this. Uh, you can see it on my website is that I have before making room was passed I, uh, I had incorporated duplexes, triplexes, uh, you know, larger buildings into the plan to make sure that we can densify because we need to. Um, I used to work in the planning department at the City of Vancouver and I did community uh, consultation so I do know how that works and that uh, you have to bring the neighborhoods along but we, we do also have to build stuff so we can't freeze, we can't roll back like perhaps Way wants to do or we can't wait forever like what Ken wants to do or have a, you know, not really have a plan at all. But uh, we do have to make sure that what we build fits in with what the neighborhood uh, traditionally is used to. So in ground-oriented neighborhoods, we have ground-oriented housing. Um, and uh, we can do this because it's done all over the world. Uh, the thing is that the, the communities have to feel like they're getting a good deal. They have to feel like, so if you go to the West End, you'll see that this community feels under attack. It feels like the, 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 the traditional rental housing has been uh, bought up and then uh, redeveloped at a pace that they're not used to. Uh, so we do need to spread the density densification around the city as well and that's what making room uh, does. Great. 
Wayne? I'm really shocked to hear that these three gentlemen are uh, supporting uh, such a, a, a dramatically mistaken policy such as making room because it basically is putting a band-aid solution across all of Vancouver and not allowing our neighborhoods and those people that live there to have any say in how those neighborhoods are going to be densified. And so this is a huge issue I think for Vancouverites and it's also a huge issue because there's no need for it. There isn't this massive supply problem in Vancouver as we've already determined. There is an affordability issue. So I think that the fact that these three gentlemen are supporting such a massive wrong policy for the city just goes to reaffirm the fact that they don't really know the city. They don't really care about the residents of the city. And in addition to that, I really want to say that the NPA has been in power in the city um, for over decades and they have not looked at this. They've not put in a new city plan. The last one that was slightly upgraded was 1995. So where, are they, where have they been in this whole equation and this whole debate? They obviously have not been able and have never planned ahead for our needs at this point in time. And Hector was with the NPA when he's voted for this. So absolutely, we must look at affordable housing, and we must okay. do this with the beginning premises. Okay, good. Hector? It's okay. It's okay. So <laughs> there's, there's a lot there. But um, I think we, we have to back up here. And, and you know, it, it's folks with two homes. Yes, we have it? to back up the making Sorry, room I, I am motion. entitled to it. I appreciate if you don't interrupt me. But if you know, I think that the issue here is is that people with two homes in the city are telling people with no homes in the city that there's no supply crisis, and that is the real functional divide here. It's not a matter of if we change; it's how we do it. Look, we've been kicking the can down the road and saying that basement suites and laneway homes and you know using the current city plan and tinkering around the edges of it is going to be good enough. It's not. If it was, seniors wouldn't be forced out of their community. We wouldn't have 9,000 less children enrolled in our schools over the last 10 years. We wouldn't have a 30% increase in homelessness in the last three years with seniors, again, making up the biggest chunk of that number. Businesses wouldn't be starved. We wouldn't be starved for cash for our community centers and public resources. We are stunting ourselves and we're hurting ourselves. But with a smart city plan where we add smart density in the areas where it makes sense, we can capture the $110 billion in mortgage-free equity in this city, put it to good use, and create jobs and fairness and affordability in this city. Thank you. And I think we'll open it up. Yeah. yeah. So lots okay. of, lots I'd, of I'd love to start. Go ahead. Great. So, you know, sorry, I, I come from a different world. I actually like to listen to people as opposed to shoot ideas down without actually listening to what people say. So, way first of all, you know what, um, you clearly did not hear what I had to say because all I talked about was consulting with all local neighbours and getting their say. So you totally missed the mark on that. Also, so uh, they, hold the on, NBA please let me, I, I, hold on, I, once again, once again, we're, we're having interruptions, it's just a different world. But it's so anyways, so, yeah, so yeah, that's fine. Like. So it's the thing, the, the second thing yeah. is, That's what yeah, I was told, okay. am I wrong? All right, it's so not, a, and the, he said it was opened up. Okay, so fine. So I'm the second sorry, thing is the NPA has not been in power for the last 20 years. Anyways, Yes. we all agree that we want to provide housing. And we're going to do that and we're going to build. What people are missing is the short term. We need immediate help now. So and so, and so, and so, okay, and, and so it's, you're not going to build it day one. It's going to take time. And so our plan talks about that. And so, you know, Kennedy, you, so you talk, you, hold on, you, you talk about, about hold on, Kennedy nobody talks about building housing. About sorry, someone, wait, sorry, sorry. sorry. Is that a sorry. question for Kennedy? Yeah. Yeah. So you talk about building housing. Mm -hmm. However, you know, you, you don't have a lot of credibility in the sense that during your time as an NP in Burnaby, mm -hmm. you sat silent as thousands of people were demo evicted from their place. And so I believe proof is in the pudding. I've spent the last two decades of my life trying to keep seniors at home and you've remained silent. And so Just how, can, how, how uh, can the city of Vancouver trust here. you? Yeah. When you say you're going to build all this affordable housing, you're going to do everything, but you were silent when you had a chance, and all you had to do okay, was I think open enough, your yeah. voice. Well, oh, sorry, this is a debate, though, so. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so what I'm confused about making room is that the NPA voted against making room, but Ken Sim says he's for it. So 
I didn't what's going on? What's I, going on? I did not say you're for making room, room but yet what your I said is I am against making for, room. I am so for, which is it? I am which for is listening to residents, and they which will decide. It? They will decide how they want to Are you in charge of your party, or perhaps we should talk to Melissa DiGenova? I mean, who's who's making I'm the decisions here? I'm in charge of the party. Here? I'm making the decisions. So why did they vote and against so what you want? It doesn't matter. Look, I'm not in power yet. On okay. November 5th, we will be in power. Which is exactly it. They just want to be in power. That's yeah, exactly the issue vote, here. Vote one it's way all about power and and it's the power all about of the backroom boys, no, 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 no. and, and, and absolutely it's about power. It's and actually we about all know finally that. giving Vancouverites people, know it is Van that it's this about is about giving power. Vancouverites because if it's a about the real change, okay, let's, let's weigh, if, weigh. And if, because if it's about real change and wanting to really affect that change, why aren't we talking about the cumbersome process of building in the city of Vancouver, period, of having Vision Vancouver and the NPA create this monster of a system that takes four times longer for anything to be built or renovated How in the are you city. Going to fix it, Wade? And so the question, <laughs> I crisis? actually, I actually have sat on the red tape committee of the federal government. Um, but what's your plan Hector, for the city? As opposed to you, who've only been in what council for eight months or something like that. How many committee members <laughs> have you actually? How many council meetings have you actually gone to? Uh, I've, Maybe I've ten or fifteen. Levels of government yes, as a ministerial a assistant. Right. So, so we, the we, point we to this to is, done, I've been I've on the red tape committee of, of the federal government. Oh. I have governance experience. We have cut red tape federally. I will do the same at the city hall years. because it is impossible it to be saying we're going to build all of these units cut, when so. the point is is that these units will not happen because the red tape at the city hall is impossible and everybody knows that. So well, we will be streamlining the process. We will be reducing the hundred taxes. There are 107 taxes associated with any kind of build at the city hall and we are going to be bringing those down and that's what's going to make uh, housing affordable in the city because the city is not going to be taxing 50% of the costs of what it costs to build in the city. How are you going to okay, reduce Okay, sorry, 50%, where did that number come from? To build a condo tower in the city, it's 54%, 107 taxes, community amenity fees, property, I mean, it goes on and on and on. You talk to any developer, any builder. 50%. It, absolutely, 50% of the costs of building in the city are taxes directly to the city. Okay, I think and the city hall has been addicted to this for over the last several decades. They're addicted to these community amenity fees, to the taxes, and that's what's been driving all of these luxury condos, the so because they're addicted to these fees. So I think one thing that actually all four of you agree on is that the city's permitting process, the delays, the red tape right. need to improve. Yeah. And this is what you're talking I about here, Wade. I am talking way. about so that, but like these gentlemen have not oh. been. Yeah, I, all, I've heard all four of you say the same thing, that you all agree on that. But I'd like to hear specifically, uh, what would you do at City Hall? You talk about reducing these taxes. Anything else you would do we would to absolutely speed up the permitting process? We would absolutely be speeding up the permitting How process. So? How so? Because right now it no, is no, four how, times. How do you do it? We are going to be re doing a review of the whole process because it's it's. I'm sure that there's a lot of redundant processes in there. My experience with the Red Tape Committee is that there are inevitably, over a buildup of decades of incompetent leadership, there are inevitably situations and permit processes that are redundant. For example, if you are applying for a permit for X, why can't you be applying for a permit for Y at the same time? But no, what I've been hearing from the builders and the developers in the city is they, they have to line up in the morning. They have to, have, has anybody gone to the city hall to do that line up? Where they are in line with any other person who wants to, you know, fix their front steps, you know, at the city, and they have to, that all costs time and money to be okay. lining up in Maybe this massive line that is ineffective. You've touched on the need to, to, to gain yeah. done more quickly too, but how would you, you know, in, at least initially, what do you think needs to be done? Sure, so I, I did work in the planning yeah. department at the City of Vancouver, so I, I know how that works inside, or at least I did it in the 90s, and I, I think it's similar. Uh, I did though talk with the folks that are working there now, and they told me, for example, they had, an emer they had a backlog of, of permits, so what they did is, and a lot of the bottleneck was at the clerical level. So what they did is they brought in three uh, new clerks, on a temporary basis that cleared the backlog. Uh, the problem is they, they let them go after the backlog was cleared. And so then you have a backlog uh, you know, uh, building up again. Part of the problem is, is that we've had double the number of permits issued uh, over the last couple of years, but the same number of staff processing. So that's gonna end up in bottlenecks. So what I've said in my platform to, to tackle this is we would you know, uh, we would initially, uh, you know, hire uh, new folks to do some processing because that's the demand from the city. That's what folks want, builders want, small, medium-sized contractors want. But also, uh, like the others, we want to cut out some steps. 
we want to cut out some, you know, there's something like 56 steps in order to take a single family home from, from when you buy the lot to when it's finished. You know, I'm sure we can compress that through a review. So initially it's get some staff on board, clear backlogs, and then, uh, and then reduce the number of steps. Ken, did you have Yeah, I have a lot to add on this one because I'm actually known around the world as a workflow expert. So actually throwing people at a broken process actually does not fix the process. Same with technology. You throw technology at a problem, at a broken system, all the technology does is make you do or make more mistakes faster. And so I understand workflow. What we're going to do, they're, instead of trying to speed up that part of the process, we're actually going to eliminate some of the process right away. So there are standard things that you can literally go through a checklist and if things make sense and you tick off all the boxes on a checklist and you have an accredited architect or professional who can actually sign off on these things, those are going to get approved right away. Then what um, Kennedy was alluding to is this process called value stream mapping. And I can tell you right now in the permitting process, it takes more than 50, 60 steps to get anything done. It's probably about 200. And so what we're going to do is we are actually going to value stream map the whole process and then take steps out that we don't need. Everyone at this table is approaching this stuff from a theoretical perspective. They actually have not done it before. So they they're work. talking, hold on, so they're talk, they're the talking about efficiency. Far more Every, everyone's than talking this. So about I let's make this process more efficient. That, Guess what? Everyone has that idea. The people at City Hall have the same idea. Do you think they're not listening? Do you think they think, hmm, our process is super efficient? No, they want to make the process more efficient. They don't know how to. And we don't actually have to hire experts. What we're going to do, because I'm an expert in the field, we're going to get city workers, well, we're going to get architects, ever. we're going to get architects, <laughs> we're going to get home builders, small Which and large, are and we are going to walk <laughs> through the process yeah, and we're going to fix it. Okay. That's just. Thank you. Well, if somebody is actually at City Hall and instead of you know handing out pamphlets a year ago running for mayor, I was actually running to get a seat at council because I didn't need the title and I didn't need the chains to think that I could go to City Hall and make some effects of change. Are you saying that change. being a member of and Parliament so what is I think that we can do is uh, work on what staff are, are telling. Excuse me, just, just that, a moment. Sorry, sorry. sorry let, thank yeah, you. Yeah. So what we can do is. Uh, focus on what staff are telling us, what industry experts have been telling us for years, and that is bring in a citywide plan. Because while I agree with some of the points that were mentioned here, talking about using certified professionals and workflow mapping and all this kind of stuff, those are, are, are um, trees in the forest. The forest is the fact that we don't have a citywide plan. We're the only city in North America that doesn't operate on a pre-zoned basis, meaning our neighborhoods are pretty much up for grab. That's what creates a lot of tension in our neighborhoods. With pre-zoning, we can cut down permit wait times, we have clarity in our neighborhoods, and we know what and where and how things will be built. The second thing that drives the amount of length of time and why we have a five to seven year lead time from application to build out is the fact that we are negotiating CACs behind closed doors with developers. This has created an enormous amount of tension, both Developers too, they, I don't know, they get the sense that they love it either. I think it's a bit of a used car deal some days where they feel that, you know, one guy's going to the office and, oh, I just talked to my manager and I can get you a better deal. And we saw that with a rental project uh, that happened not long ago where $44 million rather was almost put onto a rental project, ultimately killed the deal, and now we're getting a bunch of $5,000 square foot condos. The process is, you can't treat the disease by just treating the symptoms. Everything that we've heard here are symptoms of the disease. It's the city plan, pre-zoning, a flat rate transparent, but graduated based on density, CAC or community amenity credit. Because what we're doing right now, while uh, it was mentioned the CACs are, we are addicted to it, we are. Of our, with capital expenditures, about $1.6 billion right now on an annual budget. It represents about a third of our budget. But I think we've forgotten the Warren Buffett rule of compounding interest is that we've treated every taxpayer and every homeowner as the deepest pocket in the world and that we can just keep going all the way up to our shoulder in it. And the reality is, is we've hit bottom. So what we need to do is create more taxable square feet, more taxable doors in the city. And that will be units that will be more attainable for people that actually live here in the income brackets. We will create construction jobs and we will create revenue, public revenue, for strong public services in the city again. Can I ask you one can I ask you one question, Hector? Yes, sir. Just respectfully. Do you think seven people on council with about six or seven days notice should be able to decide the fate of our city? 
I don't believe it was six or seven days notice, but I think if you think that the debate around duplexes in the city of Vancouver has not been a 25 year conversation, I think that you need to catch up. Look, like well, the there, reality there, is, there, is some, there were a lot of look, people that were very I, I upset who weren't, who weren't heard. And look, so I, I agreed with I, them. And if you go back, roll the tape and go back, it's right on City Hall's website. You can hear me speak to this issue. I agree. Vision did a gimmicky, silly thing at the end of an election. But, you but remember, it. I ran in one on a, on a commitment last year. And I lived up to my commitment that when a choice is put in front of me to take the bold step and take a risk and err on the side of future generations and affordability for our families, I will do it. And if that meant rezoning mandated mansions on the edge of UBC to create more seniors housing and rental, I did. I, I tended to do that. Vision shot me down, but you know we need to not sit on our hands anymore, guys. This is not tinkering around the election twenty uh, edges twenty eighteen. We must get this this election right because my friends. Four years is too late, eight years is forever, and we're done if we don't make these decisions now.